میں شروع کر دوں اچھا تو السلام علیکم I will uh, uh, talk uh, about cannulation techniques uh, and uh, how to get a bilary, uh, successful bilary uh, cannulation. Uh, the goal uh, is uh, really to tell you techniques to overcome uh, uh, difficulties in cannulation and not to make an easy cannulation a difficult one. And also, uh, don't uh, make it look difficult, which is an easy cannulation. Okay? So, Uh, obviously, um, uh, main goal uh, of a uh, successful and effective cannulation is uh, to minimize the risk of complications, especially the pancreatitis, perforation, hemorrhage. And I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, different type of techniques, the old techniques, the new uh, techniques. How, should we turn the light off here too, or? Yeah, I think I have some videos so we can. Uh, So how can you improve your uh, uh, cannulation? What I uh, would say is uh, uh, you need to become a pathologist. You need to study the papilla. And uh, I usually tell my fellows, uh, you need to talk to the papilla. And uh, some fellows respond back, we talk to the papilla, but papilla doesn't talk back. So what you really need to do is, Uh, keep talking until it talks back to you. And uh, study the papilla. Main goal is uh, like uh, every papilla is not the same papilla. You have to approach it according to the shape, according to the conformation of the papilla. And remember that uh, there's not going to be one technique which is going to fit all situations. You have to match the cannulation technique to the papilla. You can uh, uh, do the older way. Uh, what I call an older way is the, like an injection and uh, then cannulation. Or you can use a wire-guided cannulation. I think uh, we uh, use both of those in, uh, based on the uh, situation and based uh, how the papilla looks like. And uh, remember that many times uh, you get these uh, uh, patients, uh, especially those people who do, uh, do uh, uh, ERCPs all the time that uh, uh, refer, uh, uh, they may be calling you or uh, sending the patient telling you that the uh, papilla is really small, that nothing goes in. So remember there's no hole that, that is never too, uh, uh, too small or it's uh, uh, too tight which uh, you can't go through. And, uh, Successful cannulation uh, never depends on pushing harder. It really is about the axis and angle. And uh, if you are trying to approach the papilla, you keep touching it. If it's distorting, uh, need to stop there. And uh, just uh, 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 reorganize yourself and reorganize your thought process, reorganize your hands. And usually selective cannulation is uh, uh, about... Uh, Uh, not really pushing, it's guiding the wire or the cannula. So, I think it's, you can, I think it's, uh, you can't see that uh, uh, it's in black for some reason. Uh, but uh, mainly is uh, about the uh, position of the scope. Most of the time you're going to see that uh, uh, ERCP is done uh, in uh, a short position. Uh, uh, Sometimes you have to do it in a uh, long position, and I think it would be best really to uh, show that uh, position uh, uh, of the scope during the live cases. But just in uh, this picture, you can see uh, when you shorten the scope, scope is really resting on the lesser curvature of the stomach. It's not really uh, uh, resting because every time you push the scope uh, uh, or advance the scope, scope is going to go into the stomach and take... Uh, 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 go towards the greater curvature of the stomach. By the way, the, when you are in a long position, uh, scope is resting on the greater curvature and uh, you really don't fall back. There is no place to fall back for the scope. Scope is only going to fall back when it's in, in the short position. So uh, not only with the ERCP, Uh, many uh, other uh, endoscopies, especially if you are doing a resection of the polyp or uh, uh, 
uh, any other work which really requires a lot of stabilization, it may be better just to keep a scope in the long position and uh, not related to the ERCP itself, but if I have to do an endoscopic uh, resection uh, of any uh, uh, polyp, any large polyp in the duodenum, I usually end up uh, using a longer scope, the Pete's clonoscope instead of a EGD scope, uh, so I can rest on the greater curvature of the stomach and have a stable position for that uh, to perform the therapy. So uh, before, when you start the uh, uh, ERCP, uh, obviously consent and indication, everything you have gone over, patient is sedated, and uh, we already have talked about that. Uh, you get the scope in there and uh, try to do in a short position. That usually is the best position, but again, not going to fit every patient. And also, as soon as you get into the position, take a fluoro image. That's what I do. I always get a scout film that gives me an idea uh, where my scope position is. Sometimes there are tumor and it's such a distorted anatomy. There is a stricturing of the duodenum and uh, uh, you think you are in short position, you are in a uh, good position, but because of the stricturing, because of the tumor, you really are very distal to the papilla, and just by looking at the scout film, x-ray film, you can tell that, oh, this is not the area where you should be looking for the papilla. You either need to move back or move further uh, downward. So uh, it is very important to take a fluoro, uh, fluoro image and also you have to memorize the movements of the scope. As an endoscopist, you already know, uh, especially with the EGD scope or a clonoscope, what does the uh, wheel is going to do, a small wheel, what does that do, uh, what does big wheel do, uh, what's, when you need to use the elevator, when you need to use the wrist. Just it has to be like you don't have to think about it. It has to become a spine reflex. It's just like driving up or riding a bicycle. Once you learn it, you know, when you are thinking maybe something else, but you are moving, you know exactly what your hands need to do uh, uh, and what your feet need to do when you are riding a bicycle. Same thing needs to happen with the uh, scoping endoscopy that uh, really uh, your brain and hands coordination needs to be trained in such a way you don't have to think that what need, movement you need to do to bring the scope or, uh, into what position. Okay. And uh, when you all have done some ERCPs, uh, I think uh, your teachers, mentors, or maybe some of those maybe taught or maybe uh, uh, you learned it uh, during the process that as soon as you get uh, to that uh, position, to the second part of the uh, duodenum, your scope is in a short position, you lock the wheel, right? Small wheel. All of you do that, right? Why you do that? Maintain the position. You are worried that you are going to fall back, right? That's the main thing. Okay, so that's what you think. That's what you have been taught, okay? But sometimes that really makes very difficult for you because you'd lose the scope maneuverability with that once you start uh, locking the wheels. So you will have to do some times, but really when uh, it's a difficult cannulation, especially in that scenario, not locking the wheel gives you a much better success and much better approach to the papilla. I know we are, especially in the beginning, you are so worried about that you're gonna fall back and uh, uh, then you're gonna get yelled at by your attending and then you're gonna have to go back. It's easier to go back, it's not a big problem, uh, but locking the wheel is gonna make it really difficult for you uh, to approach the papilla in many situations. So. If the cannulation is really difficult, unlock the wheel, okay? But if uh, you get into a position, you're facing the papilla, but you keep uh, 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 losing your position in that uh, uh, scenario, it may be okay to lock the wheels uh, once you uh, get into a stable uh, uh, position. Uh, 
and after you have cannulated the papilla, then you can lock the wheels. I personally, uh, probably 90% of the time, I don't lock the wheels. And a small wheel, I may lock uh, to some extent, but not fully, because when you lock it fully, it becomes a little harder uh, uh, for the movement. I, th I don't know uh, what you guys, uh, yeah. Mustafa. And uh, what about you? And uh, not related to this, but related to EUS, specifically scope. It's a little more stiffer, a little bigger scope. In those cases, even especially when you're doing a FNA or in, you are in the second part of the duodenum, even though you have to shorten the scope, but you almost, I almost never lock the wheels, especially in that uh, uh, scope. Uh, and because that's a little more stiffer because if the uh, wheel is locked and you fall back, that's going to cause more trauma to the duodenum and especially the duodenal apex and you may run into more trouble. So, if I can add one thing, you know, a lot of people do uh, young chicks and uh, pediatrics. Uh, firstly, I don't think it's a good idea to do that early on. Uh, secondly, if you're going to do that, they're blocking the tip of the tip probably there as well. So you have to be very careful. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, about the kids, uh, uh, that's one thing. And uh, in kids, really, uh, scope, uh, the na uh, natural scope position is like a, a L-shaped, what you can say. In the kids, it's really a straight scope. And uh, you uh, not really don't have much uh, 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 space there. It's a, such a small space. When you shorten the scope in those, I'm just uh, uh, just as extension of uh, doing a ERCP in kids, it may be at 35 centimeter from the incisors. So, and uh, then there are different uh, scope sizes based on the age of the patient, uh, age of the kid you need to use. So that's a different whole, uh, uh, different uh, conversation. I'm sure you guys are not gonna do kids, uh, especially less than 10 years, especially in the beginning uh, of your. So uh, for uh, me, uh, I am, uh, even though I, I uh, am obviously a dirt gastroenterologist, uh, but I do care ERCPs on the kids. And because uh, uh, of the uh, one reason is all the pediatric gastroenterologists, they have not much training. They really barely have a training, honestly, on EGD and colonoscopy. So, uh, all the kids uh, uh, really are referred to the adult ERCP center. There are few maybe uh, places where they do the kids, but mostly they are done by the uh, adult gastroenterologist. Having said that, when I talk to the parents, the first thing I tell them, yes, I'm going to do a procedure, this procedure on your kid, but I'm not a pediatrician. The only reason I'm, uh, they have, uh, it's been referred to me is uh, because uh, I have uh, a more experience in that. I very clearly tell the parents uh, uh, about that too. So, Khaled, we are uh, doing the same thing, and we do about anywhere between 125 to 150 ERCPs a year in generally pediatric population. That's less than 18. Less than 15, okay. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think I have that much volume, but I uh, can tell you the youngest patient I've done is a six weeks old. And uh, so, and for that, you have to get a special scope. A uh, special scope, it's a very small scope, and there are, I think there are only three or four available in the uh, uh, United States. You have to uh, loan that scope to do a ERCP on uh, uh, kids younger than one year. Between one and two years, you can use our old diagnostic scope. Uh, the Olympus we have, that's a 140 series. Uh, in patients older than two years, I usually use a regular scope, uh, adult scope. So I don't know if uh, you have a diagnostic yeah, scope we have here. A diagnostic scope. So we use diagnostic scopes. Um, I preferably use that even for, for older, depending on the indication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
with sex. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so that's a totally different topic, uh, uh, but it's good to know uh, about the, that uh, set of population too. So uh, you get to the papilla, and uh, you are s as soon as you see the papilla, you just want to get the sphincterotome and the beat uh, beat it up. The, and uh, the, so when you talk to the kids, uh, when you start beating them up, they are going to start crying, right? Same thing happens with the papilla, and uh, uh, it's going to make you cry eventually. So when you get to the papilla, take a, the be uh, most time you need to spend is on your position. Okay? Get into the best po possible position to cannulate the desired duct or cannulate the papilla. Uh, and uh, stable position. So take your time, whatever it takes, uh, to get into that uh, uh, position. Sometimes you are in a good position, you think you are in a good position, you do, can't see the papilla. The reason is uh, uh, it may be small or it's uh, uh, behind the fold, so use your cannula uh, or use your sphincter tome to move the folds around to look uh, uh, for the papilla and uh, um, Sometimes there's quite a bit of uh, peristalsis too. In uh, USA, we use glucagon. You have uh, used the same thing too. And uh, uh, to de uh, decrease the peristalsis, I think it's a buscopan here. It's available, yeah. right? Yeah, so you can use that. And uh, so here, uh, uh, the position of the papilla, when you get to the like second part, this is, if you are proximal to the papilla, that's how it's going to look like. You are looking at uh, 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 from the top. So this is the position, like the, uh, where is the scope? Scope here is really, you are looking at the papilla from far, but from the front, proximal to the papilla. Here, what, what do you think, how you are looking at the papilla on this position? Pretty much same, right? You are looking at the papilla from the uh, front, you are proximal to that. So that is really not the best position, even though you see it quite nicely, but that's not the position to cannulate the bile duct, okay? Here, actually, in this, uh, in this is the position. You really need to go further down under what I say, get underneath the papilla, or inferior to the papilla, really, uh, to get into the bile duct, okay? So, uh, other position, the best position sometimes is what we call an anfas uh, position. You are just like, it's right on your eyes. Sometimes that may be a best position to uh, cannulate the papilla too. So here, bottom line on this is like take your time uh, 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 to see the papilla, stabilize your uh, 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 scope, look at the papilla, talk to the papilla, and uh, see what type of shape that is, what type of uh, papilla that is, what should be the position of the bile duct, uh, what should be the position of the pancreatic duct. And when I usually teach the fellows, I tell them, yeah, it's really very important to see where the orifice is. But more than that, important is to take a look above the papilla, the curve of the papilla. That's going to tell you what really is the direction of the bile duct and what would be the direction of the uh, pancreatic duct. So bile duct usually uh, is going to run parallel to the duodenal wall and then goes upwards. And the pancreatic duct is going to be perpendicular and away from the duodenal wall. So if you are just going straight into the orifice and I... Uh, in the beginning, it's like as soon as you get in the orifice, you just want to push the cannula. You're not really uh, cannulating the bile duct. You're trying to cannulate the wall, duodenal wall, and that's never going to work. Okay? So you need to get into the right axis of the bile duct to uh, do the cannulation. So I'll have a lot of uh, videos uh, and I will come uh, 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 around uh, and show you those. Uh, for cannulation uh, tools, uh, 
I'm sure every, uh, uh, everybody has a sphincter at home, uh, but you can uh, sometimes uh, standard cannula works better, especially in a, what I call a really floppy papilla. And uh, then you can do an injection, you can uh, do, use a, a guide wire cannulation. I'm not going to talk about needle knife uh, uh, in this conference, but uh, that's when you get to, I think we already discussed a little bit about that, uh, uh, that uh, needle knife uh, uh, should be used uh, really when uh, your cannulation, uh, regular cannulation is uh, uh, more than 80 to 85 uh, percent of the time. And I usually, my personal view is uh, yeah, people who use more needle knife, uh, uh, really they need to uh, uh, relearn their technique of uh, ERCP cannulation. So. Uh, different sequences are options uh, of cannulation. Uh, you can uh, seed the catheter, put some uh, dye in there, inject some contrast, and you can advance the wire. Or you can seed the catheter, advance, uh, seed the catheter, advance the wire. Uh, I usually, my uh, uh, favorite technique is what I call a wire tip uh, uh, cannulation. Uh, usually get the tip in there and uh, uh, then get that uh, cannula over the tip or sphincter tome over the wire of the tip into the uh, orifice and then either guide the wire uh, first and uh, then inject or inject and then guide the uh, uh, wire uh, based on uh, the type of the papilla. So uh, these are uh, uh, some uh, uh, different types of uh, papillas. If you, uh, you can see here, um, uh, this this uh, uh, obviously is the septum uh, between the uh, pancreatic duct and the bile duct. You can the septum coming pretty much all the way, uh, uh, not all the way, maybe a little bit above. So here, when you go into the uh, or, uh, orifice, if you really stay straight, you are going to keep hitting the septum. So you need to change the po your position of your scope or position of the cannula to either go up or uh, uh, downwards into the pancreatic uh, orifice. So the, these sometimes could be uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, to uh, guide the wire or the cannula, and you just have to adjust uh, uh, your sphincter tome or the scope position. Here, you see this is one of the uh, papilla where there are two separate openings. You may not find many of those, but you will find those. Uh, here uh, is one of the examples. Like you see the bile duct, you see the pancreatic duct here. And this is a very long common channel. And uh, this, uh, it may be a shape like this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, papilla. So earlier when I was telling you that uh, uh, obviously the orifice itself is important to take a look at it. But for me personally, after finding that, I always take a look at the upper part of the papilla. What that does is that guides me which direction I need to go in into the bile duct. To me, it looks like if I go in here and follow this direction upward, that will take me to the bile duct. And from here, uh, perpendicular to the orifice, this way probably will take me to the pancreatic uh, orifice. So when you do a colonoscopy, you look at the appendicial orifice, right? It's most of the time it's a curve, right? But you don't see uh, sometimes uh, where the IC valve is. So one of the technique to get into the terminal ileum is you look at the curve of the appendicial orifice, draw a straight line from the center of that upwards, and that will take you to the IC valve, right? You just follow that. Same thing is the, with the papilla itself, too. So you go in, okay? If you, look, you really don't, uh, 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 if you draw a line from the center of this and follow that axis, that will take you straight to the bile duct. So just remember some analogy uh, in there, okay? And usually, uh, these are uh, like uh, nice papillas. You can see that this is a kind of a flat, Papilla, these flat papillas are really the easiest ones to cannulate, which are really kind of adhesed to the wall. And those are straightforward, uh, usually uh, not a big problem. If you uh, uh, touch the right place, uh, then it uh, should be uh, easier. So, 
So it. Uh, uh, So, yeah, that's a good question, uh, uh, and it's uh, easier to answer during one of the cases, but what happens is, when we come to this thing, trot me, uh, what I say is, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, and Aksad earlier used the word adequate swing trot me. So when you start cutting in this smaller papilla, you cut the sphincter, and uh, it could be up to here, it could be up to here, but the only way you're gonna find is when you cut to the first fold, you will see the sphincter. If the sphincter is still above that, that means you did not cut it completely. For me, sphincter for adequate or complete sphincterotomy, it has to split, okay? So I can show you that in a live case of what I mean by that, how the sphincter needs to split. So in those cases, always if you are not sure and the stone is the bigger, there's always a safer way to do that. Cut as much as you think it's safe and then do a sphincteroplasty, okay? That's a much safer way to do it and especially in the smaller ones or uh, if there are too many folds, you don't know uh, how far to cut. You can do a sphincteroplasty after doing some cut and that's a, also an other topic, if I have the time, uh, either tomorrow or uh, uh, we have three days, so one, I can give a talk about that, uh, how to remove the stones. I have a, a presentation on that, so we'll talk about that later. Some principles of sphincteroplasty, how much you should do, how much you can uh, safely do it uh, based on the size of the bile duct, based on the size of the stone. So it's just you need to be able to recognize the sphincter muscle how much you need to cut, especially in these type of paper loss. Okay. So usually uh, why the cannulation is, uh, becomes uh, uh, difficult or uh, uh, reasons for failed uh, cannulation in inexperienced uh, or less experienced, I should say, less uh, experienced hand is, uh, um, what we call a Sharpe papilla. Anybody knows what that is, Sharpe? I think I mentioned about that, right? Yes. So, and then there is a uh, uh, other type, it's called up and over, and then uh, there's an aberrant relationship between bilirubin and pancreatic orifice. What does that mean? They're kind of flipped. So, Sometimes that happens too. And then uh, what happens is uh, like uh, there may be a two separate openings and but you go, keep going into the one you really don't want to go into and uh, without realizing that there are two uh, separate openings. And uh, then uh, these uh, periampullary diverticulum, some of those are so easy but the other times they could be uh, really uh, painful. So it really depends, okay? So this is an example of a, a Sharpe papilla. It's a Chinese dog, and uh, these could be troublesome, these papillas. This, uh, and especially the papilla uh, is so deceiving where you start seeing a bile coming out of it, and uh, you uh, uh, see a nice orifice, and you think, oh, this is a, just a piece of cake, and you're still there after an hour, and uh, you have not finished that piece of cake. So, and this is a, an example of, uh, this is really another uh, reason uh, it's important to take a look how the papilla looks uh, above that. Like one is the orifice and how it looks above that. In my experience, what I have noticed is the one who have a bulge and that keeps deflating like during the year, so you see that you do a suction, it deflates. They have, they go up and the, uh, then that the axis goes down. So it's up and over papilla and you will see that when you, especially if you see a bulge here, you do a suction and it flattens down, that's gonna be up and over papilla. So most of the time. We're coming to that, you are too, way too ahead on everything. <laughs> okay. 
So here is, this is how you approach. That was the next slide. Okay. So this is, you see that bulge? So when you do a suction, septum falls down and that deflates. Okay. So in these cases, you have to go above the septum okay, and then have to get over. The way you do is, first you go in there and then you pull the scope back. When you pull it back, that kind of flattens it down. If that's not enough flattening, you release the wheel. That will flatten it down. Like, if you, uh, I'm not reveal, I'm sorry, elevator. You release the elevator a little bit. So what that does is that pushes it down. Okay? And then after it pushes it down, and uh, still not going in, then if you think you are in the orifice, do a little bit die. Inject, but inject very, very carefully. One to two ml at a time or three ml. And as uh, Dr. Saad said earlier, your tech should be looking at the papilla, especially when injecting it, okay? You don't want to do a submucosal injection. That's going to make the things really difficult, okay? And don't do a forceful injection because that's going to go somewhere else, okay? Uh, so in these days, uh, really, uh, usually pull the scope back, release the elevator, and sometimes you have to lean the scope a little bit to the left to get over the hump, okay? And this is an, a, a real example. You see that? If here you have a sphincter tome, you are in the orifice, and you are trying to keep going up, bowing the sphincter tome, bowing the sphincter tome, you are never gonna get in there. What you're going to do is you're going to perforate the papilla right at the roof. And the wire is going to come out of there instead of going in there. So sometimes, even though we like, uh, 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 may, we may like cannulation nowadays without injecting in there with the wire, but sometimes it's important to inject to get an idea of, about the anatomy of the papilla. But r right uh, conditions, right amount, and uh, uh, right time, that's when you inject it. This is uh, an example of uh, how to pass a scope to the stomach. So I think, again, I will show you how to pass that, uh, and we all will show you how to pass that during the uh, live cases. But uh, many are, uh, uh, in the beginning, they are just lost into the stomach. The scope is like... Uh, uh, really uh, uh, retroflex, don't know where to go. So when I, we have a live case, uh, one of us will demonstrate what is really the neutral position of the scope and what you need to do with the scope to get into the uh, 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 duodenum and how to get through the st uh, stomach. And you all know, and I heard this term, you have to let the sun set, especially when you get to the pylorus, uh, uh, to get into the uh, duodenal bulb. So the reason for that is the ERCP scope, the camera is at 90 angle, right? Okay. So it's just like you're walking front, but you're looking at the ceiling. So if the door is on that uh, um, uh, wall, and... Uh, with the ERCP scope, if I, my camera is towards the upward ceiling, and if I'm looking at that door and trying to get through that, I'm never going to get through that because I'm going to keep hitting the floor. Okay? So for that, I have to look towards the ceiling to get in a line with the uh, uh, door to get through that. So that's the concept of ERCP scope. EUS scope is a little different. The camera is at kind of 45 angle. And uh, what you do is you are looking at the ceiling and the wall where they meet and then going into the pylorus. So you will see a little bit of the pylorus with the U.S. scope to go in there. ERCP, you really let have, uh, uh, you have to let the view go uh, to get into that uh, duodenal bulb. Okay? And endoscopy, regular is uh, regular endoscopy. Okay? So here, after you get into the duodenal bulb, and then other thing, funny thing happens, especially with the trainees. As soon as they are getting to the, uh, get to the duodenal bulb, 
these unnecessary dancing movement starts. They want to go right all the way to the uh, right. Okay? So sometimes you are hitting the other wall. It's every time you get into the duodenal ball, stop there. Every time, just make a habit, stop there. They can tell you the way they do it, the way I, I'm telling you the way I do it. So uh, keep in mind there are five, maybe five different ways to do an endoscopy. All five are uh, fine, but, and you uh, choose what fits your needs and uh, your patient's needs and what you are comfortable with. Doesn't mean the other four are wrong if I'm doing one thing, but this is how I do it. So for me, I always go to the duodenal bulb and stop there. I move the big wheel away from me because I want camera to see the duodenal apex first, where that is. Okay? So it's just a gentle movement, big wheel away from you. I want to see where the duodenal apex is. Just like I guided that scope through the pylorus, I'm going to guide the scope through that duodenal apex. Once I get through that, yes, then you, you may have to do a little bit movement with the scope, but many times, it's just a very small movement, and you're just right into the second part of the duodenum. And then, as uh, many of you are going to be used to, move the small wheel away from you. Uh, lock the wheel. It's fine if you want to do that at that time. But uh, you see that here, um, like, you still see all of it pretty much. You see the minor papilla there? Anybody sees that? Right there. Okay. Minor papilla is you're going to best approach it is going slowly and staying in the long position. Okay. Or semi-long. Short position is not good for the minor papilla. They may have a different experience, but in my experience, it's either it's a long or semi-long. So here is the minor papilla. And uh, uh, you see that if you have to stop there, do a minor papilla, uh, um, uh, therapy, then this is the best position. You stop there and adjust your scope wheels a little bit and get into the position to the cannulate. But if not, that's not the case, then you go down uh, uh, under the papilla. You can lock the wheel just to uh, uh, shorten the scope. And uh, after you get into the position, um, if you are not comfortable unlocking it, what you can do is semi-long it. Uh, semi-lock it, okay? So that way, your fear of falling back will be overcome a li uh, little bit, and uh, then uh, you can move your uh, uh, scope. Maneuverability still will be maintained uh, effectively. Here you see that this, uh, after looking at the papilla, uh, looking at the uh, top of the papilla as well, you see the orifice is right here, right? And... Uh, if I have to make the same uh, analogy as I was talking about the pencil orifice, let's suppose this is right there, right? That curve. I draw a straight line upwards, thinking I'm going into the IC valve. Same thing is with the bile duct. I draw a same uh, line here all the way towards the center of the folds. You see that all those folds here? So for me, I know uh, that I need to maintain this axis to get into the bile. So, and you look at the uh, sphincter tone position. It's going into that axis right here. And this is how I usually, most of my cannulations are going to be like that, that I use a wire tip, two to three millimeter wire tip. I engage the papilla uh, with that. You see that staying at uh, like 11 to 1 o'clock or 11 to 2 o'clock position, whatever you want to say. And here just went in gently with the wire and I'm not pushing too hard over that, okay? Not pushing really and distorting the papilla. If it is not going in, I'm injecting a little bit, okay? Just to get an idea uh, like where it is. It's a little bit up and over papilla. That's what was happening uh, with that. And if you saw that, there was a little bit bulge above that too. There was a little bit diverticulum there too, so that kind of might have distorted it. So I tried the wire gently, it didn't go through that. Uh, so then I decided to inject because I'm nicely engaged into the orifice. Do not inject 
unless you are nicely engaged into the orifice because otherwise injection is all going to come out. And after you are engaged, again, gentle injection, very slowly, do not push hard. If you are pushing it slowly, your tech is pushing it slowly, it's not going, there's a problem. Just leave it uh, and uh, re-engage it. Here, uh, I don't know if you can, uh, let me see if we can see the sphincter itself. So when, when I am doing a sphincterotomy, I'm not just like going crazy, I got into a position and just going straight, zoom. Like, and uh, that sometimes can lead to a zipper cut, can lead to a duodenal wall cut. So I'm going step by step, each step cutting it, then looking at it, cutting it, looking at it, see, uh, uh, making sure that it's uh, adequate uh, or uh, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, if you have to cut the sphincter completely, cut the sphincter completely. If you are not comfortable, how de uh, uh, much more you need to go, as I mentioned, you can always do a sphincteroplasty after cutting a little bit uh, uh, to that. Uh, so tomorrow, I think I'll uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, CBD stones and uh, sphincteroplasty. I guess. Oh, yeah, we can do that. So here, uh, if I move the sphincter tone back and uh, I uh, look at this, if you look here, you see this line here? There's a lot of bile there. But that's a sphincter muscle right there. So that's what you, your eyes need to recognize that, like that muscle, and when that has ended. So that's a complete sphincterotomy. Okay? Other thing is, uh, when you do a cutting of the sphincter, that is the muscle is a little different, takes a little different cut. And, but when you get to the duodenal wall, initially you will see a little bit more whitish. So when you get to that area, just stop there. That means you may have to cut completely and don't cut any further. Again, so it's gonna come with the experience, but it will eventually come. Okay. I think this is a, another example of uh, up and over. So here, oh no, this is the same one, okay? That's what I'm... Okay. So, here is an other example. Um, uh, this is a normal uh, uh, papilla. We're talking about the aberrant uh, orientation. You see the uh, pancreatic orifice is here. Billy orifice is close to 11 to 12 o'clock position. But they're kind of a little bit uh, uh, not the perfect example. But billy orifice is not here. It's a little bit to the side. And pancreatic orifice is not here. It's a little bit this way. So just... Uh, um, uh, you'll have to sometimes recognize that uh, 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 it may be a different location uh, uh, of those openings. This is a perfect example of two separate openings. Pancreatic orifice here, biliary orifice there, septum coming all the way out nicely. There is no, uh, really uh, no common channel at all. And this is a periampillary diverticulum. I have some examples of those two. Uh, here. So as I said earlier, sometimes uh, when you have a, a, ampulla, a periampillary uh, diverticulum, it's gonna be really, really easy cannulation. And other times, it's gonna be a really problematic for you. So this is an example of one easy cannulation. And m most of the time, you're gonna see that how I uh, cannulate those uh, same uh, uh, pretty much technique in, um, uh, of that, I mean the wire technique, and uh, this goes uh, straight in there, no problem whatsoever. So it's a, uh, if it's in the right axis, right angle, uh, right position, it's gonna be a no problem. And then you get a papilla like this. You see that? Barely even see it. It's so far away. And uh, this one, uh, um, it, it took a little while, even though, and uh, I even have to do an injection. These ones, sometimes when you uh, get in there and you're struggling, or, uh, as soon as you get into the orifice, yeah, this is the tendency, just you want to just push the catheter through it. So that's when you do that, that's when you're going to uh, 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 get out of that and uh, you're not going to be successful. So here, 
you really have very gently and nicely talked to the papilla. This is one of those kids who really don't listen. So uh, you have to really talk to them calmly uh, to make them listen. Okay. I'm sure most, um, many of us have those kids too. <laughs> And uh, so after you uh, get in there, um, um, the wire moves uh, very nicely. So here is the ampulla, which is uh, at the, um, uh, right at the rim. And really even to see that, this is like interesting. Every time uh, you see the papilla and you're going to try to put the wire in or uh, uh, try to cannulate, it's going to flip to the inside. This is where, uh, right at this uh, uh, rim. You see that right here? Orifice is uh, like papilla is right there. So this is what I was talking about. Take your time to find where the orifice is and uh, then try to uh, engage that. Uh, every time I try to engage that, then it moves to the other side. So then the, I had to use a couple of clips really to move the folds to the side so I can have a better approach at and I'm uh, sure uh, uh, you guys have to do that at uh, some point too. So here, after doing, doing that, it became a little bit more stable uh, for me to at least engage it better and uh, then was uh, uh, able to uh, get in there. Okay. There you go. So this is another papilla. It's really angry uh, and uh, doesn't want to even talk to you. So it's facing even facing the other way. And uh, so again, you have to uh, talk to the papilla. And here, I'm just trying to uh, uh, move it uh, uh, a little bit upwards, uh, trying to push it. And many times when you do that, as soon as you take the uh, sphincter tome off that, it just uh, moves back. And uh, here, I have to really bow the sphincter tome so I can get it, uh, uh, engage the orifice. And uh, it's, you see that it's, I'm not pushing, really. After engaging it, I'm trying to pull it. And uh, 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 so until I uh, engage, and uh, uh, then you pull it further back, really, uh, to straighten uh, that. Because if I keep pushing it, it's just going to keep going towards, uh, downwards and uh, would never get into that. Okay. Here, you can just really practice your sphincterotomy as much as you want to do. There's so much space there, like you can keep going all day and uh, you still won't have a complete sphincterotomy, I guess. And then uh, wire guide, just uh, uh, um, is uh, actually I meant uh, double wire guided technique. So here, when uh, uh, you are trying to cannulate, but you keep going into the uh, main pancreatic duct, better thing would be just uh, get the wire in there, or even if you have gone a couple of times into the main PD and uh, you have injected it, it's just best to get the wire in there. Uh, you can leave the wire in there and uh, use a double wire technique. Uh, I'll show you, this is uh, one of the examples. Actually, I just did uh, uh, last week, I, I forgot to bring the uh, video. So remember that, uh, like first you put the wire into the pancreatic duct, and by the way, there is a technique called a reversed wire technique too. What that really means is, you wanna go into the PD, but you can keep going into the bile duct, so you can reverse the technique, get the wire into the bile duct, and use the second wire to uh, go into the PD. So here, uh, you put the wire into the pancreatic duct, and uh, just remember that when you put the wire in there, you ha really have to inject the pancreatic duct because you really don't uh, want to perforate any of the side branches. You need to know where the main duct is, get an idea about that when you get the wire in there. I know we don't want, we don't want to inject the pancreatic duct, but when you deci have decided that you need the wire in there, or you're going to put a stent in there, it's okay to inject. You don't want to over-inject and cause uh, uh, esterinization, means like all, everything is lightening up. You don't want to do that either, uh, but at the same time, you need enough injection to guide the wire into the main duct, okay? So, okay. 
here. So other thing to remember with this is when you have a wire in the pancreatic duct, you get a second wire and the cannula, you have to release the elevator for the cannula to come out. And when you do that, your pancreatic wire is gonna move out a little bit. Don't panic, it's okay. You have enough wire in there because otherwise, unless you release the cannula, you can't get in, uh, you can't get, uh, it release the elevator, you can't get the cannula out. So it's gonna be okay. So you have to uh, keep that in mind. So don't panic about that. Once, uh, other thing is, uh, um, if you uh, go into the PD, uh, just uh, uh, remember that, especially in double wire technique, or just if you have injected it, it's better to uh, just uh, stent that. For us, uh, what I usually like is non-flanged uh, uh, stent, means uh, no internal flange or a pigtail. We, uh, and th those stents need to come out. They can't stay there. Otherwise, they're gonna ca cause a ductal damage chronic pancreatitis, so what we do is we do an x-ray in uh, uh, three, four weeks. If stent is not gone, then they need an EGD and uh, we pull the uh, stent out. So this is an, uh, uh, one other thing what I wanna show in this really is uh, uh, after the cannulation, you're gonna see uh, that uh, when the injection comes, I, I need to show you one thing here. Uh, so here you see the injection, you see this uh, stricture right there? And when the uh, wire we are pushing, it's making a curve. When it makes a curve, let it make a curve, okay? And especially if it's trying to come back, let it make a curve because if the curve goes through, it finds a main uh, duct, you're never gonna cause a perforation. Curve is not gonna cause a wire perforation. Uh, uh, it's always gonna take the, uh, uh, main duct uh, and get through the stricture. Same thing is with the pancreatic duct. Once you get into the pancreatic duct and uh, you, if you get hooked up on the side branch and the wire curves, let it curve because once the, uh, it makes a loop, loop almost always will go into the main pancreatic duct. It would not go into the side branch. Okay, so uh, lo uh, looping of the wire is uh, uh, not a problem. Other thing is, this is uh, important. Uh, you um, are gonna run into this type of trouble, what we call a plastered septum. You see a really nice orifice, okay? You just go in straight in cannula, no problem. The only problem you realize you're into pancreatic duct. And then you try five times, 10 times, every time it goes into the main pancreatic duct, which you have not realized the septum is coming all the way out, and with the first nice cannulation of the pancreatic duct, you have moved the septum to the roof of the papilla, okay? So it's called a plastered uh, a septum, okay? So in those cases, you're never gonna get in there with a cannula. Okay. So you have to get above the septum, and uh, the way you do is you use a wire tip and just try to find the upper like uh, wall of the orifice where the roof starts, and you have to put the tip of the wire and try to get in between the septum and uh, uh, the roof. So that's how you're going to get in that. So I don't think we need to talk about needle knife. Okay, sounds good. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I think we'll, uh, we'll turn, okay. Five.